Hello everyone, hope all is well with you. Today we will be discussing the heat diffusivity equation in Cartesian coordinates. Now I'm going to erase this so we have more room, but that is what we will be trying to accomplish in this clip. So let's get to it. Heat diffusivity equation basically tells you how heat flows in and out of specific volumes. So, speaking of specific volumes, in Cartesian coordinates, we simply have x, y, and z coordinates. This pen is starting to die, so I thought I'd switch it out. x, y, and z coordinates. So, we can represent a specific volume, straighter volume, with a cube. I will now be labeling heat flows in and out of this cube with specific coordinates. So first up, we have in the x direction a heat flow in, which I will call Qx. We also have a heat flow up through the bottom, a Qy. And finally, we have a heat flow in through the front, a Qz, which you are able to tell how I labeled my axes, x, y, and z. Oops. Into the page is z, x, y. There we have it. Heat flows into our what I call what I will call our differential volume. Now let's represent our heat flows out. Qx plus dx. Now this essentially is saying that the heat flow out is represented by Q, heat flow, in the x direction, plus a specific distance that that amount of flow went. Same in the y direction. Qy plus a differential y. And finally through the back, a Qz plus a differential z. Now this image, this depiction of our differential volume will be referenced throughout this equation derivation. But this essentially is what it looks like. So now let's hop into the energy balance in its simplest form. We have our energy flow stored inside of this volume. It is equivalent to the energy flow that we generated, which can com uh, commonly be done through chemical reactions. Things like concrete can be a source of an energy flow generation some sort of reaction happening inside of this volume. Plus our energy flow in to the volume minus our energy flow out of the volume, which we will represent that later with these arrows that I've drawn. But first, let's hop into our stored and our generated energy flow. So our stored energy will be rewritten as our density times our specific heat capacity times our temperature, times our differential volume, and ultimately we want a flow of energy, not just energy, rho times volume, mass, mass times specific heat capacity times temperature, energy. Now we must divide this, take a differential of it. Ultimately we'll just be taking the differential of the temperature, but for now we'll leave everything in it. Divided by our change in time gives you a rate. That rate equals our energy flow generation, which we will represent with a unique Q that is specific in units, joules per second to our volume meter, meters cubed. So we must cancel that with a differential volume there. And these will be combining together and do a Taylor series expansion for. I will complete that to the left of the board so we can see it more in depth. So, let's bring it over here. Our energy flow in minus our energy flow out. This part is essential. So our energy flow in, as we discussed before, change it to blue again, Qx, Qy, and Qz. All of these represent inflows of energy into our volume. and Put that like a little squiggly. Our energy flow out, as you can see as I've drawn, 
heat flow, x plus dx, heat flow, y plus dy, and heat flow, z plus dz. All of this is representative in our image. Heat flow in, heat flow out. So, the tricky part comes into play when we combine these two things. So let's say just in the x direction, in minus out is our qx minus qx plus dx. Hmm, what can we do with this? Well, let's say our qx plus dx is equal to, well, what we started with, our qx, excuse me, qx plus a change in heat flow divided by a change in distance that we went with respect to x in this case, multiplied by the total distance that we have traveled. This is in its simplest form, a Taylor expansion, Taylor series expansion. So when we complete that for all of our dimensions, let's sort of apply this just to x now. So we ultimately have qx minus this quantity, qx minus qx. Things are starting to simplify. And this still is involved in here, so we carry in the minus sign, change in q over change in x times the total distance we traveled. So as you can see, our energy flow in minus our energy flow out, specifically in just the x direction, ultimately ends up being this quantity, negative q, negative change in q over change in x times our total distance traveled in the x. So if we apply that to the y and z direction as well, we ultimately result in the following, negative change in q over change in z times dz. I hope that sort of makes sense to you. E in minus E out ultimately is just a combined version of how you changed with respect to a distance times the total distance you traveled. So now we have representation for all of our energy balance portions. I'm going to go ahead and rewrite all of this in place of our volume picture so we have more room. We'll reference this later, but now I think we've got a pretty good grasp on what the picture is actually telling us in terms of a small volume that we're dealing with. <clears throat> so we have, hopefully you can see this, energy stored equals energy generated flows, of course, plus energy flow in minus energy flow out. And we have already rewritten this. change rho cp t dv over change in time equals specific heat flow with certain specific, uh, specificness to our volume times our dv plus here's what we have generated over here this for our x this for our y and this for our z so we carry along those negative signs minus change in q over change in y times dy, excuse me, I'll do x first, minus change in q over change in y, dy minus change in q over change in z times dz. Now, we're going to reference that cube again, because essentially our differential volume that has been brought up a few times ultimately equals, let's put this down here, our change in volume equals, the change in x, change in y, change in z. So if we kept that in mind and applied that up here, which we will do later, we will find that there is some simplification things we can do. But for now, I'll keep that there, erase this, and give us a fancier way to represent our change in heat flows here so we can work with it a little bit better. Now you might be familiar with the thermal conductivity equation, which we will put to use now, essentially says in layman's terms that our heat flow is equal to an area times a heat flux. Now a heat flux is specific to an area, of course, this is divided by area, which is why you cancel it out to get your flow. So this equation ultimately helps us plug in 
for the Q heat flow above. So let's rewrite this in terms of what we know. We know that our flux equals, this is the thermal conductivity continued, essentially this is the mother, mother load of the equations, which is our negative thermal conductivity coefficient, which is specific to any material, times the change in temperature divided by the change in whatever coordinate we're talking about, let's say x, x. So we can now apply this idea above flux times an area, which from our cube we are dealing with differential areas now. Let's say we are in the moving in the x direction. Ultimately, actually let's say we care about the z direction so we can see the face better. If we're talking about the heat flow in the z direction, our area that we are moving through is our dx times our dy plane. The z plane goes through dx dy. So we will be applying that to every area that we talk about over here. Can erase this now. So we now have our heat flux, aka thermal conductivity equation times the differential area represents these Qs. So I'm going to rewrite that in the x, y, and z coordinates so we can see a little better. x, thermal conductivity applied, will be Q equals, if we're moving in the x direction, then our plane is dy dz, which is an area, times negative k, change in temperature over the change in x. y will be similarly different plane, dx dz, times negative k, change in temperature over change in y, and z will be dx dy, times negative k, change in temperature over change in z direction. Beautiful. Now, I'm kind of seeing some similarities here. If we, let's just say, put this over here, we kind of have a dx dy dz, don't we? Let's see where that takes us. I'm going to rewrite this in, let's see, let's do red. Putting all of these Qs in for this Q, this Q, and this Q. So I'll rewrite the, I'll actually just rewrite this portion because it will take up more room. And we can throw it all together at the end. But notice, all of these have negatives in them, and these have negative negatives in them as well, so those will cancel. So we will ultimately really result in a positive change over change in x of this q, which we have defined to be dy, dz. Positive k because we changed it, change in temperature over change in x <coughs> times dx. Don't forget that. Same thing applied to all of the other q's. Change over change in y times dx, dz, k change in temperature over change in y, times the total distance in the y direction we go. Same thing for z, a, z, change over change in z of d, x, d, y, different plane, k, change in temperature over change in z, times the total distance in the z direction that we went. Now, this is the exact same thing as this, so let's rewrite all of this in our mind and kind of see Remember, our dv equals dx dy dz. So, if we rewrite, let's see, how can I make this neat? If we erase all this because we finally used it. Pretend this is shifted down. Now we have this portion. Q, specific to our volume, remember, dx dy dz. That's our dv. And on the other side, we can pull out our constants. Let's do that. dx, dy, dz. Change in temperature over change in time. Wow. It looks a little complex at this point. However, if you notice, we have a dx, dy, dz in all of our terms, which we can, again, we can pull out our constants. Nothing changes with respect to y, x, or z. 
respectively, so we can pull out those dx, dy, dz terms. And I mentioned before that we would be using an infinitesimally small volume, and that will ultimately allow us to divide by this dv in order to simplify this equation. So let's go ahead and do it. I'll do it in green. Cancel, 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 d dx, dy, dz, all goes away. So we ultimately result in our density, I'm going to write this a little further to the left, our density times our specific heat capacity times our change in temperature over change in time equals purely just our generation flow, it's kind of nice, plus the change, the change in what might you ask? Well, that's the thermal conductivity coefficient times the change in temperature over change in x, all divided by change in x. Keep in mind this dx, dy, dz went away. Have the same thing for the y direction, thermal conductivity coefficient, change in temperature, change in y, divided by change in y, plus change of the exact same thing in the z direction, divided by change in z. Wow, this is very much simplified and ultimately the main format of the heat diffusivity equation, which is what we wanted to derive in Cartesian coordinates. Now as we get into cylindrical and spherical, it gets a little bit more complex and we will see that in the next video, the spherical, to be specific. But ultimately we have R density times our specific heat capacity times our change in temperature over change in time equal to our heat generation flow plus our thermal conductivity representation specific to each coordinate that we are moving in. And in this case, X, Y, and Z Cartesian coordinates. Thank you for listening. Next video soon to come for spherical coordinates. Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. In this clip, we will be discussing how to derive the heat diffusion equation in spherical coordinates. It can be a little bit more tricky than in the Cartesian or cylindrical, but we will be discussing it in depth so we understand how to do this. To start out, I'm going to depict an image of, an, of a volume specific to a sphere. This will, we will eventually take an infinitesimally small amount of this volume, but I'm going to enlarge it so we're able to see it a little bit better. So we still have our x, y, z coordinates in order to see this, but keep in mind we will be using the spherical coordinates today. So on the x, y, z, I will draw a little slice, if I can do it well, of a sphere. Picture this in three dimensions, in which our new coordinates will be, I'll label this r, this is our theta, and this will be our phi. So today we will be discussing r, theta, and phi. And it can be a little confusing as to why there's two angles, but if we picture this as a slice of a whole sphere, we will have two angular directions that that slice is located in. So I'm going to draw over here just another 3D portion to help us see better what kind of slice this is. Now, bear with me to picture this, but say we tore this out from here and rotated it to here. So I'm actually going to rewrite our R as down here, same distance, which will represent this. Our theta will be represented on this side, but we have to discuss the fact that we will be talking about distances of this slice, not angles. So I'll bring up again when we start the derivation, the fact that we need distances is crucial, not angles when we're discussing our volume. So this height will be equivalent to kind of like an arc length, r d theta. So I'm going to label that here so we don't get confused. This will be our radius, but we're doing a differential of it. So we will have differential length, differential length. And finally, this length up here, which is represented by this distance, will actually be radius times the sine of theta times our d phi. Now, I know that can be a little tricky, but it's kind of like complex 
polar coordinates, r sine theta d phi. So now we successfully have our depiction of what a slice of this sphere will look like. I'm going to ha go ahead and dive into the heat diffusion part of it now, in which we need to label heat flows in and out of this volume. So in this direction, the r direction, we will have an incoming heat flow, qr. In the theta direction, which is this way, we will have a q theta. Q is heat flow, watts, also known as joules per second. And in this direction, the phi direction, sort of similar to x, y, z, we will have Q phi. Similarly, all of these heat flows coming into the volume have to exit the volume, and we have to represent that as well. But instead of just QR, Q theta, or Q phi, we now have in the theta or in the phi direction, excuse me, Q phi plus a certain differential phi that we traveled. So we went in, coming in at the same, exiting at a certain flow in which the distance we traveled is accounted for. And finally, our last two, Q theta plus D theta, and coming out of our page will be QR plus DR. So now that we have our picture, let's go ahead and dive into the energy balance equation, which I will do in red. So in general, just like with Cartesian, we have our energy flow stored in this volume equivalent to the energy flow generated in the volume plus all of our inputs, energy flows in, minus all of our energy flows out. This is a general balance equation, in this case specific to heat or energy flow, represented with the dots. So now that we have this, let's go ahead and start assigning equations to these values so we can get the correct derivation. Start out with energy stored. This will be equivalent to rho, density, times the specific heat capacity, times the temperature, times a differential volume that we have. So since this is an energy flow, we need to have a change in the numerator divided by a change in time. And that's how we're going to represent flow. Notice that our density times volume represents the mass. Mass times specific heat capacity times the temperature gives us energy, and we must take a change in that over a change in time to get a flow. We're going to represent the energy flow generated by another equation known as heat flow specific to a certain volume, so we must have our units joules per second times meters cubed times a differential volume as well to cancel out that meters cubed. Finally, our energy in minus our energy out is going to be a little bit more unique, so I'll represent that to the left. E in minus E out. So how do we represent this? Well, we drew it over here in blue. All of our heat flows in, one, two, three, minus all of our heat flows out, one, two, three. So I'm going to draw those, QR, Q theta, and Q phi. And all of our energies out, energy flows out, is QR plus DR, Q theta plus D theta, and Q phi plus D phi. So what can we do with this? Well, if you notice that we're doing in minus out, so let's get a new way to represent R out. So let's just discuss the R direction. So QR plus DR can be rewritten as QR minus QR plus, excuse me, QR plus, it will be minus in the end, QR plus our change in Q divided by the change in R times the total distance DR that we have traveled. This is an expansion, Taylor series expansion of this direction. So in the theta direction, we will have Q theta plus D theta equal to Q theta plus total distance, or the total heat flow divided by the change in distance that we went in that direction times the total distance that we have traveled. 
finally, for the phi direction, q phi plus d phi equals q phi plus the change in heat flow divided by the change in direction times the total direction, the total distance we went in that direction. So if you put these two together, E in minus E out, we ultimately end up doing QR minus QR minus these values. So ultimately, our E in minus E out in each direction is negative change in Q divided by change in R times DR, theta negative Q, change in Q over change in theta times d theta, and phi, negative change in q over change in phi times d phi. So ultimately, this is how we will represent this portion of E n minus E out. So if we put all three of these together, you'll notice that we still have dVs. We still have a little bit complex things going on. So let's try to simplify this in a new way again. I'm also going to put to note that our differential volumes over here, kind of like Cartesian where it was dx, dy, dz, will now be our dr times r d theta times r sine theta d phi. A little bit more complex, but it makes sense with the distances. Distances are heavily emphasized in spherical coordinates. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this portion and give us a new way to represent our heat flows using flux and the thermal conductivity equation. So we know heat flow in general, Q, equals a certain area times our heat flux, represented here. Now this could be in any direction. In Cartesian, we had x, y, z. Now we could have the heat flow in R is equal to the area that that flow is going through times the flux in that direction. So if we were discussing the R direction coming out of the page in this case, our certain area will actually be the plane that that is going through, which if we have an infinitesimally small volume will be R d theta times R sine theta d phi. So as you can see, with the area planes not being simply dx dy dz, it's going to get a bit complex. So let's represent it per per direction we're moving. So in the R direction, let's replace this Q with our area times our flux. R direction. We have negative change over change in R of our area plane R direction, which will be R d theta, R sine theta d phi. Super important not to get your distances messed up here. theta d phi. I might run out of room, which is okay. We will remember these two equations once we arrive to the end of our derivation. Make sure still recording. Yep. So we're here. Now, times our flux. Our flux can be represented with the thermal conductivity equation, which says our flux through a certain area over a certain time, that's what flux represents, say in the R direction, equals negative K, the thermal conductivity coefficient, times the change in temperature divided by the change in that specific direction that we went. In this case, just our dr. So we have our area, and now we will have our flux, negative K, change in temperature over change in radius, dr, also known as dr. Perfect, and we can't forget to multiply by another dr on the outside. Theta direction, negative change of q, which we will represent with flux, equals our area that our theta direction is. Theta direction is coming through the bottom which is dr times r sine theta d phi. Times negative k times our change in temperature over the change in theta distance that we've traveled. So this is where we need to represent distance again. 
and our distance in our theta direction is r change in theta. Can't forget that extra r. And then we multiply by d theta. We're ready to move on. Phi direction, negative change over change in phi of q, which is area times our flux, area in the phi direction, finally, going through this plane, which is dr, r d theta, which is our last combo, dr times r d theta times whatever flux is represented by, negative k, change in temperature over the distance that the phi direction represents, r sine theta d phi, r sine theta d phi times r d phi, don't forget. So, this also looks like a lot, but we can simplify. I'm going to go ahead and erase all of this above, because now our en minus e out is represented by these equations. And we can further simplify in order to make our lives easier. So I'm going to write the simplification part in green, in which we pull some terms out, because you'll notice that this entire bracket portion is based on a change in a certain direction, in this case r. So we can pull out whatever doesn't change with r, or possesses an r. So that's what we're going to do in the r direction. As additionally, these negatives will cancel. Everything will be plus, thanks to that negative k in our thermal conductivity equation. So we have positive change. Actually, let's pull out first. Let's pull out first. So what can we pull out? Pull out a d theta, r sine theta d theta, and the dr can be brought over. So, r d theta, r sine of theta, d phi. Good, good, good. Bring this dr over to the left side of changing with respect to r. What's left? Oh, we cannot pull these R's out. Silly. My mistake. We cannot pull these R's out. Because we're changing with R. Cannot do that. So everything we can pull out, d theta, sine d theta, d phi, and dr. Now we have R squared left inside. What else do we have? K. Change in T over change in R. R. That's what we have left. Okay. Now in the theta direction. Whatever doesn't change with theta or has a theta in it, we can pull out. So we have, notice this R cancels with this R. So we can pull out dr, d phi, d theta. dr, d phi, d theta. dr, d phi, d theta. And what's left? Sine of theta on the inside. Good, good. K times change in temperature over change in theta. Finally, in the phi direction, nothing changes with phi in here, so we can actually pull out those things. dr, r, d theta, and d phi. dr. Oh, notice that this r cancels with this r. And we have a sine theta in the denominator getting pulled out. dr d theta, d phi, and a sine of theta in the denominator getting pulled out. Cool, cool. Change in phi of simply our k, change in temperature over change in phi. Brought that over. Let's just make sure. r squared left on the inside, d theta, sine of theta, d phi, dr, k, change in r, dr, r cancels with r, sine of theta stays in, d phi comes out, d theta, dr, d theta, r cancels, sine in the denominator, d phi, perfect. So now we have our simplified version of the en minus e out in green. Now the most essential part 
rewriting everything and dividing by our dv because we have an infinitesimally small volume. So if you'll remember, our energy stored, rho cpt dv over change in time equals q specific to a certain volume times dv plus these three plus our r plus our theta plus our phi from above. We'll just leave it here so we can see it better. So now we will be dividing everything by dv so we can represent the spherical image of an infinitesimally small volume that we possess. So if we divide by dv, that goes away, that goes away. So we have left change of rho cpt over change in time equals simply q, again, specific to a volume. And let's go ahead and start canceling things out. So divided by dv, divided by dv, divided by dv. What are we left with? Well, in the r direction, we can get rid of d theta, sine of theta, d theta, sine of theta. There's an r squared, so we will have an r squared left in our denominator. d phi, dr, and we had our r squareds written. Perfect. So, over r squared, we have change over change in r of r squared k, change in t over change in r, plus what can we cancel out in the phi direction? dr once again, I'll put a line through it now, d theta, d phi, d theta, d phi, we have an r squared in the numerator and a sine theta in the denominator, or r squared in the denominator, sine theta in the denominator, because we're dividing. r squared sine of theta of sine of theta change in t over change in theta. And finally, in the phi direction, I'll be erasing dv, dr, gone d theta, gone, d phi, gone, dividing by sine of theta, so we will have sine squared, sine of theta squared on the denominator, in addition to an r squared on the denominator. Of change over change in phi, k, change in temperature over change in phi. This represents the heat diffusion equation in spherical coordinates. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for our next clip pertaining to similar Hi everyone, in this clip we will be discussing the finite differencing form of the heat diffusion equation. So I will erase this in order to have more room. Let's remind ourselves of what we derived in the earlier clips of the heat diffusion equation. Let's say we will be discussing it in Cartesian coordinates and simplify it, change in temperature over change in time is equal to alpha, where alpha is k over rho cp for simplification, times the second derivative of the change in temperature over the change in, let's do the x direction. So we chose the x direction because let's say we have a bar here and we split the bar into multiple sections. This is why it's called finite differencing because we take actual distances instead of infinitesimally small distances. So here's our bar. I'm going to discuss the form T 
subscript j to the n, in which our n is going to eventually represent time, and our j will eventually represent distance. Thus, let's call each of these certain distances, certain sections in which, let's say, this is j. In the future, the temperature, say, as it enters the left side, j plus 1, j minus 1. It could theoretically enter from multiple directions, but let's just say that we have sections that look like this. So we will now be applying this formatting to this equation, time and distance kept in mind. So the change in time, or the change in temperature over the change in time, finite differencing, we will take the derivative, which is equal to our tj remains the same, time, n plus 1, it's sort of like taking the slope, minus tj to the n over change in time. That is what we have for the left side of our equation, and we will set that equal to what we do similarly on the right side, but this is going to look a little bit heftier because it's a second derivative. So let's say t j plus 1 this time, because we are talking about a distance to the n minus t of j to the n over the change in x. I'm going to erase this side now that we know this formatting. Now we will be subtracting t of j to the n minus t of j minus 1, because we will be in the position before, also over the change in x. Now all of this is a second derivative, so we will be doing the entire slope of a slope of itself with respect to x. So now we are able to simplify this. As you see, the right hand of the equation can ultimately be similar to t to the n, j plus 1, minus, minus, which will end up being 2tj to the n, minus, minus, plus t to the j minus, of j minus 1 to the n, all over delta x, delta x, Let's square that delta x. In the right-hand side, we can leave the same, and then we'll subtract over to get t j to the n plus 1 by itself, which represents a certain time in the future that we will be getting by itself on this hand, the left-hand side. Change in time. Now we can simplify even further, and we can call some certain things constants t j to the n plus 1 equals, multiply this over and add that, positive t j to the n uh, plus alpha delta t. Let's pull out this delta x squared. It's going to get a little tight. And t j to t, I always do that, t plus, j plus 1 to the n minus 2t j to the n plus t j minus 1 to the n. Ultimately, this is the form we will be dealing with when we hop over to CoLab. And this marker is going to die. But when we start representing the temperature within this bar for a certain scenario, we will actually be calling this alpha delta t delta x squared r because all of those are constants and our r is given, so we will be evaluating at a specific r, and we will see certain stipulations and certain limitations that have to do with, ultimately, this derivation of the finite differencing of the heat diffusion equation. Thank you for listening. We will hop in to that next. Hi, everyone. If you recall from the last video, we derived the heat diffusion equation expressed in finite differencing terms, and we will now be able to apply and plot a time-varying temperature profile based on a specific problem with a long bar. And in this specific problem, we have the long bar that has an initial temperature of 300 Kelvin, 
one side has 350 Kelvin applied to it and one side has 400 Kelvin applied to it. And we want to see what happens in that bar within certain sections over a certain time within certain time increments and look at the cool graph that's made. So let's go ahead and dive into Colab in order to do that. That is the assignment. Let's go ahead and open a new Colab. Laboratory. Perfect. So first, we will want to assign or import, assign variables and import certain things that we need from Colab in general. So first, numpy, common practice, import numpy as np. Then we will say subplots, we will import make underscore subplots. Also a general practice for importing into Colab. Dot IO as PIO and PIO templates default, I believe, equals plotly underscore dark. Oops. Underscore dark. Cool. I believe that's all we need to import. For now. Let's go ahead and assign our variable. So when we discuss variables, in this case, we had, in the finite differencing, we had an expression t subscript j to the n. And that j represented distance, and n represented time. And we will now be assigning nx as our distances. Let's say we have 100 sections in that bar for now. And time increments that we want to plot, let's do 20,000. Now, it was given that our R value, which recall is alpha times change in temperature divided by the change in distance squared. We derived that from our previous video. And it's given that that equals 0 0.1. Let's go ahead and define temperature t equals np dot full of what? Of our sections of distance and we initially started at 300 Kelvin, as I mentioned. Now we want our x, x is to arrange based on those sections. And let's go ahead and assign initial temperature on each side. First one equal to 350. Float t of negative 1, which collab indexing states float Collab indexing starts at zero, so the negative one value is the value behind the first value, which is technically the last value. It's a little confusing, but next, let's go ahead and write new line of code to make these figures. Figure equals make subplots, please, rows. We want one, columns. You want one. Then we're going to tell Colab to add a scatter at x equals x, y equals, of course, our temperature, mode equals line, let's call it, oops, and name, let's call it initial. Now we will be doing a for loop that says for i, of course, in range. What's our range? Well, from 1 to all of our temperature values, all of our time increments, excuse me, all of our time values, and we will be assigning that derivation that we had in our last video of the heat diffusion equation in finite differencing terms, that Tj to the n. So we will be assigning that portion now, T of 1 to negative 1, which if you remember the indexing, that represents the middle section of our values, of our section, middle, middle section of our, of our values. And that was t1 to negative 1 plus r times the quantity of t, now let's say 2 and onward, minus 2t of the insect inside 
insects inside plus our t from the beginning to a negative two location. So all of all of them are accounted for now. And let's say if i is a hundred percent, set that equal to zero, and we will be adding scatter plot. Of course, the exact same that we had above. Mode equals lines we had, and name equals initial. Perfect. And finally, let's show the figure, because why would we not want to do that? Let's check everything. Ooh, bad spacing, bad spacing we had. I like spacing out things. Checking, ooh, checking that they're spaced out correctly. Might be an OCD thing. Important on BS. NP. Subplots importing the correct things. Variable. Ooh, we said 100, did we not? 20,000 nx to 300, r was 0.1 to start, but we're going to try some other r values to see what happens. Check, check, check. Good. Okay, shift enter is the key. And I again broke this up into sections so we can see if anything messes up where specifically that's messing up at. But we hope and pray for check marks. We already didn't get a check mark. That's bad. Default equals. There we go. And finally, let's see if we can get a cool graph out of this. Already, no. Oh, indexing here. So, I already know what I did. Multiplication symbol. Do that all the time. All right, fingers crossed. It's a good feeling. Oh, look how cool that graph is. So as you can see, we have a lot of time increments in here. We assigned it 20,000, so. As you can see, as our time increments increase, we almost approach a linear relationship between the two ends of this bar. So let's go ahead and see what happens to the profile as we increase our R value. slowly approaching a more linear relationship, it appears to be. Let's try an R right at 0.5, which we will soon to see we will soon see. 0.5 is a pretty important number when it comes to finite differencing. Very, very nice linear relationship. If you look at quick glance, it's exactly what it looks like. It looks like sort of a hammock shape as we start from our initial temperature profile without anything applied at t equals zero, and so we increase. We see this cool relationship. Now let's see what happens when we increase to 0.55. Check, check, and let's see. Woof. You'll notice that there's a ton of zigzags. What's going on? This looks nothing like the profile we just had, so why is, what's so special about 0.5? Well, we will see in our next clip that our R value with this method of finite differencing cannot actually exceed 0 0.5. It becomes unreliable, unstable, and there's a huge limitation within this method. So we will also find a better method, but for now, let's just note the difference between R is 0 0.55 and R is 0 0.5. Let's just appreciate the perfection of 0.5 once again. See this temperature profile for this bar? Beautiful. So that's, that's how we represent our previously discussed problem in Colab, importing the correct things and creating a figure based on sections of the bar and sections of time that we want to plot. Thank you for listening and stay tuned. Hello everyone. In this clip, we will be covering the von Neumann stability analysis, proving why a value of r greater than one half gives us issues from our previous video. 
to start out, I'll be reminding you of our equation that we had previously. Tj to the n plus 1 equals Tj plus r Tj to the n minus 2 plus 1 Tj to the n plus Tj minus 1 to the n. If you recall, this resembles our distance, x, and this m resembles our time, t. So, throughout this clip, I will also remind you of Euler's equation, because we will use it, which states e to the ix equals cosine of x plus i sine of x. And additionally, we will also use e to the negative ix equals cosine of x minus i sine of x. And that's due to the even and odd functions of cosine and sine, respectively. So moving on, I will prove using these two things that our temperature equals e to the i k x, e to the negative alpha, a squared times time. This is what we will be proving using these two things. And if we recall our heat diffusion equation, change in temperature divided by change in time is equal to alpha times our change in our second derivative of change in temperature over change in position, in which case we determined x. So let's plug in t for each of these t's, taking the derivative respectfully to x and t. For this left-hand side, we have, let's change colors, let's do blue. So if we take a derivative of this with respect to time, we will result in e to the ikx due to exponential rules, e to the negative alpha k squared times time, and the chain rule results in a negative alpha k squared in front of all of that. And on the right hand side, we will have alpha. And note the first derivative of this with respect to x will be e to the i k x e to the negative alpha k squared t times i k. So therefore, the second derivative will equal alpha i squared k squared e to the i k x e to the negative alpha k squared times time. And as we know, i squared equals negative 1. So we have a negative, negative, alpha, alpha, k squared, k squared, e to the i, k, x, e to the negative alpha, k squared, t, and the exact same thing on the right-hand side, proving that this start equation is absolutely true. Going off of that, we will be rewriting this true statement in a Fourier's equation, summation, essentially stating that t equals the sum from k from negative infinity to infinity of some constant k, c, c sub k, which we will have the computer programming express for us because it's very complex to do by hand, multiplied by e to the i k x e to the negative alpha k squared times time. Exactly this expression up there. Now we will be taking this out of the Fourier's equation and expressing it in a new way, a way that looks familiar to us with the distance and time, j and n respectfully, in there, and say tjn is equal to i k j delta x e to the negative alpha k squared n delta t, in which delta x times j is our original x, and our original t is n times delta t. So with this in mind, we will proceed and express our original equation that was written up here in terms of this. So let me rewrite that in a different color to remind us. T j to the n plus 1 equals t j to the n 
plus r t j plus 1 to the n minus 2 t j to the n plus t j to the j minus 1 to the n e of no, just j plus j minus 1. Now we will be replugging in the e expression for what's inside the parentheses to make our life easier, and I will be factoring out tj to the n in the process. So we have tj to the n plus 1 equals tj to the n plus r t j to the n. Now we have the j plus 1 position, which we will plug in here. And if we plug j plus 1 for j, we will result in this entire thing times e to the i k x, simply because j plus 1 plugged in for here, I'll write it over here, j plus 1 delta x. If we plug in j plus 1 here, we get e to the i k j delta x, e to the i k delta x. And this is the portion of the regular tj to the n multiplied by this, of course. So that's sort of shorthand how we will attack it and apply the same thing, minus 2 tj to the n, plus same thing, but there's a negative ikx here now. tj to the n e to the negative ikx. So we've gotten this far, and we will now proceed by factoring out and plugging in Euler's equation cosine, the cosine function that we expressed earlier. So we will have t j to the n plus 1 equals, factor out the t j to the n, t j to the n of 1 plus r times 2. Remember that cosine was the even function, and sine will cancel because it's this minus, this plus this, and this one was a negative, and this one was a plus up here. So you'll have 2 cosine k delta x. These should be deltas up here. No biggie, no biggie. Minus 2 due to this 2. Now, we will be solving for r in a unique way to prove why r cannot actually be greater than 1 half. Let's factor out this 2 so it's easier to see. k delta x minus 1. So now we have tj to the n plus 1 equals tj to the n 1 plus 2r cosine of k delta x minus 1. So now let's, let's set some inequalities here. So this entire portion of the expression must be between negative 1 and 1. Now you might ask why. If it was greater than 1 or less than negative 1, then this would be a factor something bigger than an absolute value of 1, making this left side greater than this right side always. And that's good if tj to the n plus 1 is greater than tj to the n in general. However, if we start approaching large numbers or infinity, then our temperature profile will also approach infinity, which we know is impossible. So that's why we have to have this whole section in between negative 1 and 1, so we don't run into that issue, which therefore means if we subtract this 1 out of here, there should be a second parenthesis here. If we also here subtract 1, then I will write it so it's easier, 2r cosine of k delta x minus 1 must be between negative 2 and 0, divide by 2, r cosine k delta x minus 1 must be between negative 1 and 0. And next we have the fact that our cosine function must also be between negative 1 and 1. Negative 1 and 1. So if our cosine function is between negative 1 and 1, 
cosine function minus 1 must be between negative 2 and 0. And if we take the low end of this, we have negative 1 less than negative 2r, which divide by negative, flip the sign, we have 1 half must be greater than r. So nothing can be greater than a half for r to be stable. This proves why our coding messed up when r was greater than 1 half. And we kind of ask ourselves if this is realistic or if this is a big limitation. And it turns out that because alpha is, because r is alpha delta t over delta x squared, if we have, say we want to take a lot of time increments, a lot of pieces of time throughout our time interval, then r starts to grow. If we want to take a lot of little sections, if we want to take a lot of big increments of time, then we run into an issue. If we want to take a lot of little sections of distance, then we also run into an issue. So r being less than 1 half isn't really realistic, and it proves that there's a big limitation on finite differencing when solving, especially on CoLab. So we will find an alternative route so our r isn't limited by this coefficient. Stay tuned. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. Hope you're doing well. As mentioned in our previous video, we have a limitation on our R coefficient in the heat diffusion equation when we do finite differencing. So in this case, we will be solving with a new method called the Crank-Nicholson method, and we will prove why our limitations can be avoided with this kind of way of solving the heat diffusion equation for our specific specified problem. So let's go ahead and jump into it. To remind you, we will start out with the heat diffusion equation that we know and love so much. Change in temperature over change in time equals our alpha value times our change in temperature second derivative divided by the change in position squared. Well, der second derivative, change in position. So with the Crank-Nicholson method, we will be solving the left-hand side in a similar way that what we did our finite differencing in, and the right-hand side will be a little bit more manipulated, and I'll elaborate when we get to it. So, as we know, our left-hand side will be T, J, to the N plus 1, divided by delta T, minus T, J to the N, of course. Simply solving for change in time, derivative, J represents distance and represents time. Finite differencing similarities equals alpha. And we saw before that we had a change in x is squared in the denominator from our finite differencing method. But now we will be taking, instead of one specific time, we will be taking the future time and the current time average of the temperature expansion that we solved for before. So. In that case, we will have T, don't forget the uh, way we solved last time, J plus 1 minus 2TJ plus TJ minus 1, of course. But this time we'll do N plus 1 minus the entire quantity of this to the N divided by 2 to take the average. TJ plus 1 to the N plus 1 minus 2TJ to the N plus 1 plus TJ minus 1 to the N plus 1. All of that plus what we know before, tj plus 1 to the n minus 2tj to the n plus tj minus 1 to the n, like I said, all over 2. So I'll be rewriting this in simpler form so we can solve it easier. But that's essentially what our expansion looks like with the Crank-Nicholson way of solving this right-hand side. So let's get tj to the n plus 1 on one side and simplify this down a bit. Alpha change in temperature, change in time, excuse me, divided by 2 change in x squared. So that's the difference between that and our r value. This is now our r value. Times, oh, I forgot r tj to the n addition, tj to the n plus 1 equals tj to the n plus. Our r times 
this entire quantity once again. T, J plus 1, can get a little confusing, but it does get repetitive, so as you write it, it becomes easier. T, J plus 1 to the N plus 1. T, J, 2 minus 2 T, J to the N plus 1, plus T, J minus 1 to the N plus 1, plus T, J plus 1 to the N minus 2 T, J to the N plus T, J minus 1 to the N. Whew. Okay. So now we have it in terms of this. This is what it looks like. Now I will be getting all of our N plus 1s on one side and all of our Ns on the other while simplifying this in terms of R as well. So let's rewrite that. Start a little bit farther to the left over here. T, J to the N plus 1 minus R times T, J plus 1 to the N plus 1 plus 2 R T J to the N plus 1. Well, we have some similar terms here. We'll simplify that in a second. Minus R T J minus 1 to the N plus 1 equals T J to the N, can't forget that, plus R T J to J plus 1 to the N, R T J plus 1 to the N, minus 2 T J to the N, once again, similar terms, we'll simplify in a second, plus r t j minus 1 to the n. Perfect. Now I'm going to rewrite this next line in blue because we will be using it later for our matrix simplification. Matrix simplification. So let's pull out and put in order j plus 1, j, j minus 1. We have negative r t j plus 1 to the n plus 1 plus t j to the n plus 1 of 1 plus 2r. Check, 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 minus r t j minus 1 to the n plus 1. Similarly for the left hand side, or the right hand side, excuse me, t, or sorry, positive r t j plus 1 to the n plus, pull t j to the n out, 1 minus 2r, should be an r right there, my fault, plus t r, plus r t j minus 1 to the n. So this form will be essential in a future step. Let me expand this out and look at it in matrix form. So we have, let me just check, Men, negative r t j plus 1 to the n plus 1, plus t j to the n plus 1, 1 plus 2r, minus t j minus T j minus 1, R T j minus 1 to the n plus 1. All of our n plus 1s are on the left. Similarly, this is an R uh, that is sloppy. Positive R. T j plus 1 to the n plus T j to the n, 1 minus 2 R plus R T j minus 1 to the n. Perfect. That is what we have so far in the expansion of our Crank-Nicholson method. And now you might be asking yourself, well, we have one time over here in the future, one time over here in the present, present temp time, but we have three different positions for each of those times. How the heck are we going to go about solving this? Well, might I remind you of Euler's equation from our previous clip, where we represented things in terms of cosines and sines, e to the ikx, things like that. We will be now simplifying that into this portion. So let me do this in red again, the black's about to die. So on the left-hand side, let's factor out t, j to the n plus 1, and successfully factor out our negative r, r, t, j, excuse me, factor out, yeah, our negative r, e, to the i, k, x, because we are in the j plus 1 form, and from the previous clip, we know the expansion of that ends up being this, plus simply 1 plus 2r, minus r e to the negative i, k, x. Similarly, on the right-hand side, let's pull out t, j to the n, so we can represent, we can, uh, represent tj and plus 1 tjn together and see what they their patterns do tj to the n similarly positive r e to the ikx plus 
1 minus 2r plus r e to the negative i k x. Boom. So we're looking at that and we're looking, okay, it's getting kind of simplified. That's good. Let's go ahead and alter these interior of our parentheses to the cosine form, what we know. And let's go ahead and divide this entire side by this. And it might get a little tight down here, but we can go ahead and try to do it. T j to the n plus 1 equals T j to the n of what? Of what this entire interior for each parenthesis value, sorry if it's getting a little tight, turns into 1 minus 2r, 1 minus cosine of k delta x. From our previous video clip, we know that that's what the expansion of r e to the i k x, r e to the negative i k x does because cosine and sine are even and odd functions respectively. So we need to, is this still recording? Yes. So we need to cancel out those signs and this is what it turns into. Divided by the 1 plus 2 r times 1 minus cosine of k delta x once again. Boom. All right, so now we're looking at this. Okay, cool, pretty simplified. We can see how tj to the n plus 1 and tj to the n are related. And we are going to do something similar to what we did in the finite differencing video where we see, okay, what can r be? Is there a limitation on this r? Let's see. So we know our 1 minus cosine of k delta x always has to be positive. And that's because of the similar inequality that we had to our previous video, where the cosine of anything has to be between 1 and negative 1, and 1 minus something between 1 and negative 1 always has to be positive. Which also indicates that 2r times that has to be positive as well, because r, as we defined earlier, being alpha change in time over change in x squared. These are all real positive things. A change in time has to be positive. A change in our distance has to be positive. And our alpha value will always be positive as well. So therefore, this section that I've highlighted here has to be positive too. And if we represent that, let's just say those positive values are tj to the n Let's just call it 1 minus q, 1 minus q. q always has to be greater than 0. And if q is greater than 0, 1 over 1 minus q over, sorry, 1 plus q, that ratio always has to be, always has to be, this whole value always has to be less than 1. And this is absolutely incredible news for us, because if we have tj to the n plus 1 equals tj to the n times something that's less than 1, that indicates that our tj to the n is be greater than the tj to the n plus 1. And this is the opposite of our last pattern proving that we don't run into compounding issues where, oh no, our temperature profile, our temperatures are approaching infinity, which is what we don't want because that's not real and that's not stable and that's why we got those funky graphs on the previous clips. So now with this, this opposite of relationship between tj to the n and tj to the n plus 1, we can successfully show that r absolutely has no limits, which is great for real life scenarios. So let's go ahead and apply this circle blue equation to a matrix example with our bar that we have defined. If you recall, our defined bar is simply a bar that has a temperature initially of 300, and one side is applied at 350, and one side temperature is applied at 400, and we must represent the temperature profile with that with respect to time and position in the bar. Sounds a little crazy, but it's not, as we saw in CoLab and as we will see once again in CoLab. So let's go ahead and start proving this 
Craig Nicholson idea to a real life matrix form of this equation. Hopefully I can fit it all above. So we have this equation in order j plus 1, j, j minus 1 respectively of a future time on the left hand and a current time on the right hand side. That's what the n plus 1 and n represent if I didn't elaborate on that before. So it's finally time to start applying matrix ideas to this. Let's say with our bar we, call, we want to cut six sections. You can cut as many sections as you want, and the exact same process will be present, but we'll just do six for simplicity, one through five, or zero through five, excuse me, same sort of indexing that CoLab provides, noting that the zero and the five position, also known as J, are our boundaries, which we will apply and elaborate upon once we draw our matrices. So let's draw the left-hand side. Hopefully I can draw these pretty accurately. Hmm. And I'll just draw the left-hand bar of the right-hand side. Okay, so let's start out with the left-hand side of the equation. Our T of 5 temperature Let's say that end is the 400 degree, just so we can increase. And our T of zero position is 300 degrees. 350, excuse me, 350. 350. And this whole section will represent Tj to the n plus 1, because we are on the left-hand side. So we have T at j equals 1, t at j equals 2, t at j equals 3, and t at j equals 4, of course, to the n plus 1 for all of these. n plus 1, n plus 1, n plus 1. So now that we have the central t to the n plus 1 represented for our left-hand side, let's go ahead and finish this section of our left-hand side. Now, Notice that the middle part of this left-hand side is all of our Tj's. So the coefficient applied to that Tj will be present in every single J that we have. So I'm going to make this look more like a square. Hopefully you can still see it. We will have our 1 plus 2R in the top left-hand corner running all the way down diagonally, being applied to all of our J's. Hopefully I space this out. Correctly, not bad. Cool. Now, moving on to the left of this, we have our J plus 1 position. And our J plus 1 position has a negative R applied to it. So J plus 1 means that our J of 1 will never actually occur. J plus 1, when we start at 1 inside of these brackets, will actually just be J plus 2. Or J equals 2, excuse me. J plus 1, when J is 1, is actually j equals 2. So we will be a step ahead, which means all of our negative r's for that. This diagonal represents j plus 1. This diagonal represents our j minus 1. Similarly, our j's that go to 4 for this section will actually only go to 3. So this, that's why the matrix is so cool with its diagonal with its diagonal processes. And if you notice in these two sections, we'll have big fat zeros, which will be present in any, no matter what, in any um, dimension of matrix, J minus one. Perfect. So let's go ahead and attack our right-hand side. I'm going to, I'll leave that. So now we have our whole left-hand side covered. Let's go ahead and jump into the result of that at our, 4 by 1 vector represent a matrix in our 4 by 4 vector, or 4 by 4 matrix. And again, this is our tj to the n plus 1. Oops. There we go. Cool. So the right hand side of the equation, let's go ahead, I'll do it in red, excuse me, as well. For our j plus 1 position, we have, we're going to do this again, 4 by 1, so all the way across, 
R, T, J plus 1, J is 1 at this location, which means we have T, J of 2 to the n, plus T, what is J? J is 2. Actually, I'll do the coefficient in front of it. 1 minus 2 R, T, J is 1 to the n, plus R, T, J minus 1. And if J is 1, then our J minus 1 is 0 to the n. I'm going to leave another section blank over here, and we'll come back to it. So let's continue down the line. J equals 2. R T J plus 1 is 3 to the n plus 1 minus 2 R T of J, which is 2 now, plus R T of 1 to the n. Same thing. These matrices get repetitive, but that's okay because they're supposed to be a pattern. It simplifies the way we look at when we look at these equations. And finally, t of 4. t of 4. If j is 4, r, t j plus 1 is 5. 1 minus 2, r, t of 4 to the third, or to the n, plus r, t of 3 to the n. Now again, I'm going to put a blank here. Now I'll be elaborating on it. These two blanks will represent our bounds. In this case, our T5 and our T0 at 350. And that's super important because over here, if you noticed, our J plus 1, our T of J equals 1 never got covered for that negative R. So that is where our fifth term will come in. If J equals 4, J plus 1, actually, this whole thing gets added over. So we will have an RTJ of 5. R T J of 5. And that simply represents our boundary condition, sort of, sort of similar to initial conditions, boundary conditions, because the applied temperature to the ends of those bars will always be that 400 and that 350. So that doesn't fluctu fluctuate. So we have to account for those two because those could change given whatever the problem is. If we change these temperatures, then we'll have to alter that. And that needs to be accounted for. Similarly, our J minus 1 value, if our J equals 1, we need our J minus 1 value to still be accounted for where it wasn't up here. So we add in this entire term over, and we get R T of 0. R T of 0 simply for those two initial temperatures, if that's what you would like to call them, end temperatures, end of the bar, if this was our bar kind of looking like this, because this represents position. That's how you can think about it. But this is essentially how you would set up your matrix, matrices for this applied problem using the Crank-Nicholson method. And as you remember, our R value does not have limitations, which is great news for us because our finite differencing gave us a little bit of limitation with that R has to be less than 0.5. But now we will jump into CoLab and see numerical values and cool temperature profiles of this problem once again using the Crank-Nicholson method, and you'll see that those R values are actually not limited, which is great for real-world problems. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Bouncing off of our last video from the whiteboard, we will now be representing the Crank-Nicholson method for our previously specified problem where we have a bar initially at 300 degrees, 300 Kelvin, and a heat source of 350 and a heat source of 400 are applied to both ends, and we will be viewing the temperature profile as a function of both time and position on the graph. So we will also be viewing that there is not an R limitation when it comes to the Crank-Nicholson method, and that can be extremely helpful in real-world situations. So first, I've already made a section. We will be just bouncing off of our previous code. Here's our nice temperature profile that we had from before with the finite differencing. However, our R is set to 0.5 because that was the limit. Anything greater than that, we have an unstable, unreliable temperature profile. But we will now see with the Crank-Nicholson method that's not necessarily the case. So I will be importing something called the solve banded command, command, which we can look that up really fast. It has to do with matrices, which if you recall from our previous video, we dealt with 
This is the abandoned matrix that we will be looking at, and we had both sides of our equation in the previous video in ma excuse me, matrix form. So we will be importing that in order to use it later on. So let's go ahead and dive in. <coughs> First, we will be establishing our temperature. Temperature num B, temperature matrix, temperature profile, and simply call that NX, the number of sections we have until 300, which is our, let's float that, which is our initial temperature. And we will be saying that each end of the bar as stated will be 350 and 300, respectively. Keep in mind the syntax here. The zero is the first position and the negative one is the last position. So in our previous case, we had six sections. Our T of zero was our first J equals one position and our T of five was our J equals six position, six, sex, six section. Well, our J equals, actually those were our initial conditions. Our J equals one was our T of one and our J equals five was our, four was our T of four and our zero and negative one positions, our first and last zero and five were our first and six positions. I apologize if that was confusing, but if you remember from the previous video, J equals one to J equals four was what we plotted inside that matrix and J equals zero and J equals five was out of our matrix because those were our initial and final boundaries initial and final, initial and initial if you technically look at each end of the bar as the starting applied heat temperature, but we will see if that was confusing, we will see these positions as we proceed. So let's also float these because if you don't float them, they give you, nope, they give you an error, which is very annoying. Whoa. Okay. Nope. Thank you. All right. So as we stated before, the banded has uses A and B, so we will now be beginning to define that as the left hand side matrix, left hand side and right hand side matrix from before. A equals, let's just import a simple zeros matrix of a three by n x minus two. And that is simply because our number of n's last time or nx's were was six and we ended up with a three by four matrix on the left hand side. And if we say had fifty sections, we would end up with a three by forty eight simply because the first and last are excluded. Like we said before, our T of zero and our T of T sub five, T sub zero, T sub five, which is our locations, J equals zero and J equals five, were outside of the matrix. So let's go ahead and jump into defining our sides. So the J minus one, the J and the J plus one of the left-hand side of the matrix will now be defined in terms of our A, which is what we have here. So the J minus one position is actually equal to negative R, if you recall. No, don't do that. And our middle one, one on, J equals one, section equaled one plus two times R. That was our next section, and we had A of 2, also equal negative R, respectively. Perfect. Don't do that to me again. Don't do that to me again, please. Okay. Now for B, the right-hand side of the equation. Similarly, we will import, have our zeros come in from simply NX minus 2 for the same reason as before have that match. Nope. And we will be defining our regular B, which is kind of long, on the right hand side, which was R times temperature from J plus 1 all the way on plus 1 minus 2R two, 2 times R times our T of J, which ended up being 1 to negative 1, first to last value, Oops, forgot the multiplication symbol that would yell at me. Plus R R our R times T 
all the way up until the j minus 1, which will be the second to last value. Okay, similar to our a example, we will be defining, I'll explain this in a second, b of 0 equal to b of 0 plus r times t of 0. And this represents from our last clip, if you recall, that we had in the top row, we had that extra r times t0, and in the bottom row, we had that extra r times t of 5, I believe, since we had six sections. That represents our initial applied heat source on the left and right hand side. Those never change with time because it's a heat sink. Constantly gives the exact same 350 and 400 no matter what time. And that's important to apply. It's kind of like your boundary conditions, important to apply when discussing each end of that bar. So let's go ahead and write the B of negative 1 as well, which will be the last position. Who knows how many sections we have, so that's why we have to define it in terms of that kind of syntax. This was supposed to be of 0. B of negative 1 plus R times T of negative 1. Perfect. Beautiful. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So let's go ahead and make sure that this is working correctly and start defining a second figure and make, make subplots so we can see an actual temperature profile. Let's add, and we're going to add a underscore, underscore scatter from find x equals x, y equals t, whoops, y equals t, and name, this is just our initial, initial. Perfect. So let's see if it works all the way up to here to plot our initial temperature profile. Control equal, or control shift, excuse me, control shift. We have to go all the way through just to make sure that correct R value is applied. Here's the finite differencing example. And let's see if we can make a plot of this. Oh no, RT is not defined. Oh, that's because it's R times T. It always gets me somewhere with that multiplication symbol. Beautiful. We have our initial temperature profile here. 300 all the way through, the 350 applied on the left-hand side, and the 400 applied on the right-hand side how it affects that bar from our sections. All right, now that we know that that works, let's start applying a for loop for i in range. Well, what range is it, might you ask? It is the end number of time sections plus 1. Make sure we cover our, bound, our bases there. For the i in range of that, we will state that the temperature locations in the middle of all of our j's equal our banded. Knew we had to call that 1 comma 1 just for syntax and call our a and b variables that we defined. I'm also just going to copy all of our definition for b and put it inside this for loop. Quick tab, quick tab, so it automatically updates and inputs all that we need for this profile. And I'm also inside of this, if I percentage, going to put this similar to what we did with our finite differencing example. If I modular 100 equals 0, then we are going to add scatter underscore scatter, correct? Yes, underscore scatter. Always forget that of the exact same thing, x equals x, y equals t, name equals, not initial this time, let's do function of i. i, oops, do that every time. Boom, boom. Cool. And then we gotta go ahead and say to show that second figure, second figure. There we go. See if I have all this right for ion range and t plus one. All of our multiplication symbols are there. Copied and pasted that. Cool. Fingers crossed. Again, our R is still at 0.5. So 
let's just make sure our temperature profile looks correct for our defined characteristics. There's the initial, and fingers crossed, we have a temperature profile. Yes, look how beautiful that is. Once again, approach is linear as you increase time. Over time, same application of heat, we get that approach. So this is an R is 0.5, so we have yet to prove that Crank-Nicholson is actually a better method. So let's go ahead and mess around and call this 0.75. This will be the ultimate test. If we get a stable profile, then we know that Crank-Nicholson is superior. Ah, look at there's a finite difference thing, pretty ugly. If we get uh, the Crank-Nicholson to look anything like like a real temperature profile graph, then we know our work here is done. Look how beautiful. So once again, as we proved with both the whiteboard and now CoLab, we have shown that the temperature profile still looks correct and stable, no matter what value of R we input. There's no limitation on R. We are happy to give our thanks to Crank Nicholson for coming up with this method of matrices so we can get not ugly graphs like this one. Once again, our R is 0.75 for this example, and our temperature profile graph still looks very, 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 very accurate. Awesome. Thank you for listening. That concludes all of our clips in how we've been solving a uniaxial bar problem. Multiple ways, multiple methods, lots of fun. Thank you.